Arabia 557, once established, call the tower on 1186. Once established, 186 Arabia 557. Thank you for your help, say good day. Arabia 523, Tower. Rebecca Roth establishing herself as a foremost expert on 9 11. That combines about 30 years of her career as an international flight attendant to purser. Rebecca has been able to bring into light what really occurred on that fateful day. Welcome to the program, Rebecca. Well, thank you so much, George. It's a pleasure to be with you. So tell me a little bit more about yourself other than what we just had. Well, you know, I had flown around 30 years. At the time of 9-11, I stopped flying in 2004. I really didn't pay much attention to 9-11, what happened it really changed the career so much. So those last three years were not easy for us. I could have been on one of those jets that went sideways there on 9-11. I missed it by about eight to ten hours. I commuted from coast to coast, and I just could have been there. I was home, luckily, and I watched it unfold. And when I did, I saw things that weren't right. But when you're doing this for a living, it's impossible to look at it in depth. We always knew that jets would scramble within six minutes if we needed them. And on that day, we saw NORAD didn't scramble jets for over an hour and a half. I knew that the government, that our military was going to be there should we need them. So after I retired, a BBC article popped up dated September 23, 2001, right after 9-11, and it told that the Saudi government was threatening to sue the FBI and the U.S. government for claiming that six of its citizens were the alleged hijackers, and they, were, in fact, were still alive. And I was like, what? And at that moment, I guess it was my time. God said, it's time to wake up, lady. And I started doing thousands of hours of research. I used all of my years of training. We had specific protocols and hijackings and any evacuation or any emergency commands that we all knew. If I would have got on a different airline than what I worked for and there was some kind of event, I knew what commands they would use and I could have just jumped right in and helped them evacuate the aircraft. And I knew their commands because it's pretty universal what we were taught to do. And that was one of the things that uh, caught my eye. And then when I started digging deeper into the phone calls, that is really the training is what I kept going back to is why did this happen like that? Why would they say these things? And we'll talk about some of those things later on. And the details of the calls, especially that the flight attendants did, because the uh, FAA protocols in our training weren't followed by any of the flight attendants or any of the pilots on board. How about the whack job that just uh, charged the cockpit and he got tackled by the, by the uh, people who were on the plane? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's probably what would have happened if the scenario we were led to believe really did happen on 9-11. The aircraft on 9-11 were taken over remotely using what's called the flight termination system, and it's a remote control device that was sold to some U.S. carriers. It's a plug-in to Boeing's onboard computer. It's a plug-in device. I tell people it's almost as simple as a USB plug-in to your computer. Very simple. You don't have to re rearrange your computer. But it was sold to some commercial airlines in the event, listen carefully to this, in the event that a hijacker were to get into the cockpit and take control of the aircraft, we, I don't know who we are, but I think I have an idea mm -hmm. now, we can take control and remotely land that aircraft anywhere that we can get. And there's nothing the hijacker could do. That's correct. And there was nothing that the pilots could do on 9-11. So you think... Here are the pilots doing their thing, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, they can't control the plane. That's correct. Would they know instantly that somebody was guiding no. this plane? They would never. It was sold in the event that a hijacker took control. They would never in a million years have dreamed that that device was actually controlling their aircraft. They would have just thought they were having some sort of mechanical. And the interesting thing about the flight termination system, and one of the reasons why a lot of the pilots and the Airline Pilots Association, their union, did not want this thing put on, is that once the flight termination system takes over via the transponder frequency, and so air traffic control loses track of you, you are no longer showing your transponder on their radar, and you lose all communication. 
You can't even communicate with the flight attendants in the cabin. And we are the eyes and the ears of the pilots because they have a cockpit door between us, them and the co- uh, cabin. They yeah. don't know what's going on back there. Interesting. The information that I discovered was literally so mind-blowing for me. It, it made me physically sick when I really figured out what had happened and how it happened and who did it and how it was covered up. I wanted to take all the information that I discovered in these thousands of hours of research I did into the entire event, not just the airplanes and where they went and what happened, but everything. I didn't know about the Brady Bonds and stolen gold and the put options and all of those things. I only knew about the crashes and the hijackers. Right. And write a book so that it would help wake people up to what has happened to us. Because 9-11 isn't our past, it's our future. All right, well, let's talk about what we were told, Mm -hmm. first of all. Four planes taken over by 19 Middle Eastern terrorists who had been training and flying, you know, at schools, flight schools. Uh, Are you saying that none of that occurred or that part of it occurred? What's your overall view there? What I discovered is, like I said, the first thing I discovered that six of those hijackers were a Saudi Arabian uh, citizens, and the Saudi government was suing the FBI. Not only were they using their names, but they were using photographs from their passports and their ID. Of, of, and, pe- of people who were not on that plane, you're saying? That's correct. Those people are are, had never, one of them had never been to the United States, and he didn't know what a Pennsylvania was. He was supposed to be on Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville. All right, where, where are those six now? I mean, why, why wouldn't, see, you know, if somebody had a picture of me as a terrorist <laughs> taking a plane, and they used it in, uh, in Britain mm-hmm. or the Middle East, mm-hmm. and I'm here, mm-hmm. believe me, you're going to know that I'm here. Right. Well, the Saudi government stood up for its citizens and was threatening to sue, and I never could find a settlement, but I'm sure there must have been one, because they, they, and that was one of the things that really triggered my research, is that the FBI was being sued, these people were still alive, and four of them are pilots for Saudi Air. And being an airline professional for 30 years, I thought, wow, can you imagine trying to travel as a pilot? or flight attendant, and being accused of being a terrorist for the a new Pearl Harbor. Oh, not, the, uh, it's not going to happen. But, I mean, <laughs> w- why haven't these six, though, come forward to say, hello, here I am? Well, they did. And as a matter of fact, you know, that's part of that BBC article, and their government sued. And what we were never told as Americans through our media and through the government handing out information to the media that this the lawsuit was either settled out of court or that these people really were alive. The FBI did eventually say that, well, there could be some mistaken identity and there may be a, a stolen IDs, but they never reneged on that. If you look in, in Wikipedia, those four or six citizens that are still alive, six of them, four of them are uh, professional pilots, they are still considered to be one of the 19 hijackers hmm. from 9-11. Okay. They never changed their story. All right, then the official version 5, 5, 5, and 4 of those four planes, mm-hmm. um, they took control of the plane. They, you know, slit throats with some people with their box cutters. They somehow got their way into the cockpits. They all somehow got to fly the planes. Uh, I still think the, uh, the one in Pennsylvania was shot down by us. So what do you think happened on that plane? Give me your give me your thoughts on that. Okay. Well, um, you know, one of the things I kept reverting back to is the FAA protocols and what the flight attendants should have said and done and what they did and what they didn't do and just lining up with those protocols. One of the things that was a protocol, the FAA hijacking protocol at the time of 9-11 was called the common strategy. And basically that strategy was to delay, 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 and prevent the hijacker from getting into the cockpit. And that meant delay any way we could. And there were many ways for us to try, and that, that was put out there for us in our yearly training. And one of the things you wouldn't want to do with a hijacker, a real hijacker on board, would be sit on the telephone for a half an hour. And on Flight 11, we had two flight attendants talking on the phone for 27 minutes. And the things that they said were what really woke me up. One of the things that the flight crew should have done was to sit down and to not draw attention to themselves 
And what these first two did on the first flight, Flight 11, is they sat on the phone for about a half an hour, 27 minutes, both of them. Well, how do we know and, that, first of all? Well, because it's well documented. One of, them's, I'm, one of them called her supervisor in Boston, and the other one called reservations. And so the reservations agents and the security officials from American Airlines documented that. Okay. Only four minutes of her call was taped to the reservations agents. Something went wrong with their system. Oh, but the other gal, a lot of her stuff, and she was actually talking to a supervisor who was a personal friend, so that's how they know that was 27-minute phone calls. And they both called in at the same time. And like I said, if you had a real hijacker on board the aircraft, that would be the last thing you would want to be caught with as a phone, a cell phone, any kind of air phone, anything to your ear, because you, he would think that you were ratting on him and telling him who he, telling the people on the ground who he was, sure. and foiling his plan. So making a phone call for almost a half an hour was a huge red flag. Not only did they not ever tell the most important bit of advice that day, to, if they had called someone on the ground, would have been how that person got into the cockpit. And that's the only thing they should have been saying, and they never did say that. So these are the things that I, I looked at real closely. And so here we have on that very first flight, two flight attendants call in. At the same time, they call in about 20 minutes after takeoff from Boston. Well, let me ask you this first of all, Rebecca. Is it unusual for flight attendants on a plane to be making phone calls? Very. Because, okay. uh, first off, the cell phones don't work at altitude. And right. second off, those air phones are all gone now because they were horrible. You could only use one in first class and maybe one in coach at the same time. They were very, very bad uh, okay. quality. And they were expensive. So, oh, yeah, yeah that's they were. the whole thing. The phone call thing is just really crazy. But, you know, according to the government story, they were mostly all calls from cell phones at altitude. So. Uh, now, 20 minutes after Boston, they would have been pretty much at cruise altitude, probably close to 30,000 feet, depending upon the traffic pulling out of Boston. And this flight attendant, Betty Ong, they both call in at the, about the same time as well. And she says, this is the stuff that I could not believe. Now, I got most of this stuff from an FBI written document, transcript of what she said. And she said that he, as the hijacker was one hijacker, and he was a he, he had sprayed pepper spray or mace in business class, and we can't breathe in business class. Well, I've been on planes over this last 30 years where some real cheap per perfume was sprayed in one <laughs> cabin, and guess what? The entire aircraft smelled it and complained about it, right? Right. And so I knew that, and I knew that, um, you know, she's sitting on the phone for 27 minutes, and she never complained to anyone she was talking to about Having, suffering the effects of mace or pepper spray. She never coughed. She never complained about having a hard time breathing or anything like that. And let me just say this, because this is kind of earth-shattering. Most people don't think about this, and partly because they just don't have the experience I have with that cheap perfume. If you sprayed pepper spray or mace in a pressurized cabin, everyone would be feeling the effects of it. That would be the hijackers, the pilots, all the flight crew, and all the passengers. That indicated to me that that plane was no longer pressurized because she said they only had trouble breathing in business class, huh. and that's not real. All right, so what does that mean if it was no longer pressurized? That means it was on the ground somewhere. Already? Already. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes from Boston. And then huh. she said something else that really got me, and I, this is when I told my husband, oh, my God, this is a message for a flight attendant, because only a flight attendant could hear this. She said, he, as in that one hijacker male, he stood upstairs, and there are no stairs in a 767. There's only stairs in a 747. And I immediately knew she was in a hangar. That's interesting. Got the chills yet? I'm getting there. Okay, and then she goes on to say to a reservation agent, we're the first. And yes, indeed, Flight 11 was the first of the four aircraft. And then I realized that it start, was starting to look like she had been told what to say and what was going to happen that day by someone. All right. Let's, let's make... Go ahead. She kept trying to convince the people that she was talking to reservations. She said, we're up in the air. And she said that a few times. We're up in the air. Well, saying you're up in the air in a hijacking is kind of like saying... You're, when you were carjacked, well, I was in my car. 
because, of course, your uh, hijacking only takes place in the air, because if somebody tried that on the ground, we'd blow those chutes and get you out of the airplane. And so I thought, well, why would she say they're in the air? It's a hijacking. That doesn't make sense. And then she went on to say that she was seated at her jump seat at 3R, which is the very tail section of the 767. The other flight attendant on the phone at the same time was giving completely conflicting information. So the version that we have, of course, Mm -hmm. you know, the couple of those planes hit the World Trade Center. Are you saying that, well, obviously something hit the World Trade Center and we're pretty sure they were planes. Mm -hmm. Are, Are you saying they were not those planes? That would be correct. And how I, di- how I dissected this or deconstructed this was through all of the phone calls made on all four flights and, and the similarities of what they were being told to say. And then I charted, here's my devil's tower in the living room. I charted what the NTSB, what the FAA said the aircraft were doing. Now, the, according to the official story on Flight 93, the aircraft's coming down at more than a 40-degree angle and part of it, part of that time upside down while those let's roll guys were bringing hot water into the cockpit. Impossible in a 757. Okay. Impossible. What planes, in your opinion, hit the towers? What we saw hitting the South Tower looked like a 767, but it's actually a little bit out of uh, sizing for the 200 series that it was supposed to be. And there's some kind of pod formations underneath it. There's some oddities that the pilots are telling me that they see, too. And they want to know how in the world, have I figured this out? And no, I haven't. But how in the world did they get that aluminum plane? Because we've seen hail, hail strikes um, leaving, you know, Chicago and Detroit. And so if you can get baseball hail, that'll just rip a plane apart and you can have a serious problem. Or a bird strike. I mean, literally go make a hole right in the aircraft. It, how could you get an aluminum plane to fly through a cement and steel building like that? Uh, airline professionals cannot grasp that, and that's the thing that I saw. I thought it was trick photography that morning. I could not. I just can't. I still did this day. I can watch that video over and over, and I can't understand how did they do that. Um, let me kind of continue a little bit with the, the other flight attendant on that first flight that sat on the phone for such a long time. She did something else that raised a red flag for me as a flight attendant and a professional. She made, uh, did something that was a mistake that no flight attendant would ever, ever make. And she called into her supervisor and claimed that the hijacker was seated at 9B. And then she called back and changed her mind later. But first off, you would never, ever call and say that a hijacker was someone unless you were 100% sure, and here's why. In that common strategy tactic, the FAA protocol, our job was to delay, 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 delay them getting into the cockpit, right? That's right. And then the whole plan was to land that aircraft. And if it was had the flight termination system, somebody could be doing that remotely for us. I didn't work for an airline that had that. So, well, let me ask you something. Would a pilot open up the cockpit door if they were told that hijackers were systematically killing people on the plane until they opened up that door? No. They would not? No. The only thing that's really important to us as professionals, and this is pilots, flight attendants, pursers, all of us, when we put our uniform on, your safety as passengers and the safety of that aircraft are our number one concern. And so his number one concern would be to land that airplane land somewhere that plane and get a somewhere. SWAT team. And if somebody died back there, it's not going to be all of them. Right. And there's and no so way 20 minutes into that flight the crew members would have opened up the door, gone to the bathroom. I don't see that happen. That happens no. later on. Later on, I've seen that happen on a plane, mm-hmm. but not right away. Yeah. Exactly. And so as I started looking at it, I thought, well, first off, if, we, if I called in and said 9B was the hijacker and then I didn't get a chance to change that story and we landed, the SWAT team takes over or the Army Rangers come in and they'll take that guy down. It's a mistake you just wouldn't make as a flight attendant. And so I, for some reason, one day while I was doing all this research, I thought, well, gosh, I wonder who they said was this hijacker, 9B. And so I started to look, and unbelievable, the guy was a trained assassin. 
He was also an anti-hijacking specialist and a hostage rescue specialist. He was from a foreign intelligence agency. He was fluent in English. He grew up in Denver, Colorado. He was fluent in Hebrew and Arabic. He grew up in Denver until he was 14, moved to Israel, and then he learned Hebrew and Arabic while he was there. And so I'm like, well, that's really interesting. And then when the flight attendant calls back to her supervisor, she said, oh, no, I made a mistake. The hijacker was in 9B, I mean 10B, and not 9B. 9B's been stabbed by the box cutter, right? Mm -hmm. So here you've got this guy who is a trained anti-hijacking specialist, a highly trained assassin, a hostage rescue specialist, who is fluent in the language being spoken by the hijackers who are planning the new Pearl Harbor, the attack of the century on America. And for no uh, reason, and there's no apparent reason, they decide to get up and stab him with a box cutter and kill him. Because we're led to believe that he died. He was stabbed by a box cutter. And how did they systematically know it was him? There's no answer to that one. And he, is, he was involved in uh, the Israeli special intelligence operations. It's referred to as Sayeret Matt Call. These are the uh, trained assassins, and they do the anti-hijacking and hostage rescue. So these would be the specialists that Israel would send to a hijacking, and like in Tunisia or someplace, you know, that go rescue their uh, passengers. And they, they have actually been used. Benjamin Netanyahu's brother... And Benjamin Netanyahu was Sayeret Matkal, and his brother was actually killed in a hostage rescue attempt yeah, he was. Uh, quite a while ago. I found that really interesting that we have this guy who is listening to these people speak Arabic and plan to take over the aircraft, and for no reason they get up and kill him. Yet, this guy, 9B's friends, said about him he could kill any human being using a pen and a credit card. Let's just move on from him because All right, there's, next. there is a lot, and there's a lot in the book about him. And so it's really interesting to me that the flight attendants were saying, one was saying a doctor and a nurse were taking care of 9B after she said he was stabbed, and the other flight attendant, same flight, was saying there was no medical people on board. And so I'm saying, well, hmm. okay, you've only one, there's only one reality inside an aircraft cabin. So I like watching all this stuff and reading through, and I just took massive notes and drew all these charts of what the government said the aircraft was doing. Some of the aircraft were coming out of the sky. I know you've flown, and I know you know what this means. Six to 10,000 feet per minute. Yeah. And you're expected to believe that someone's sitting on the phone showing no emotion, no fear, and that would be a very frightening thing. That's, that is beyond if you were to do an emergency uh, De- descent for uh, decompression. You'd be pushing, go that coming down that fast. I mean, the aircraft makes sc- very scary noise. People are scared. People scream, and none of that's going on. So let let me ask you this: Are you saying that the so-called hijackers, whether it was taken over electronically or not, not the point here? Mm-hmm. Are you saying they were not, or they were on the planes? The nineteen hijackers that you are led to believe. Six of, well, I've actually found mm-hmm. 10 of them alive. The other nine, they're fake people with a, a first name from somebody's ID and a last name from someone else's. So there were not Arab hijackers on any of the real passenger manifests. Another thing that's interesting about what the FBI claimed were the passenger manifests in that first 72 hours, they came up with four different names that are not, there were 19, but four of them were different than what they are right now and what they've been ever since about three or four days into this event. And it's interesting because three of those people showed up alive. One of them was an FAA employee, and he said no. Um, and he was an actual an FAA aviation safety employee in Florida. And so he, of course, went to the FAA and then went to the FBI and said, I wasn't, I'm not a hijacker. You, how could I be on the manifest? I was at work, and my brother, who you claim was also on the manifest, has been dead for a year. And the other two guys showed up alive, too. So quickly, uh, while, we were, while we were unfurling our flags and figuring out who were we going to point our guns at and kill over this attack, the FBI quickly changed their story. And the actual story about Mohammed Atta's rental car with the Koran and the flight manuals and his will was actually assigned to the brother, uh, the FAA employee, and his dead brother. Well, and I, I've got to tell you, too, Rebecca, of, of anything that I heard 
finding a passport of one of these reported hijackers in the rubble <laughs> was the most bizarre for me. And they found two. One was in Shanksville and one was in New York. In pristine condition. And the only passports they found were from those supposed hijackers, yeah. not any passengers. Now, consider this, that there were nearly 100 people on Flight 11, and only one hijacker's passport must have gone from his shirt through the building, through the explosion, and floated down. It's amazing. There were four crashes. There were, uh, but they were not these aircraft. These aircraft were all taken to the same location, and how I found that... One, I actually flew out of Boston for a while. I knew that the phone calls had to have been made on the ground. On one of the flights from Boston, going to L.A. that hit the towers, my uncle from my mother's marriage, he's still gone. So I want you to tell me where he is. Where is he and everybody else that happened to be on those other planes? Well, um, you know what, as... What I did to discover this is I kind of dissected as I've been doing these phone calls, and I took them flight after flight after flight, what they were saying, what the planes were doing, and I discovered that the people making those phone calls had been told about what was going on, going to happen that day. And I'm sorry for your loss for your uncle, and I'm sure that he was uh, more than likely an innocent passenger, much like the crew members, and they are all dead. They just didn't die the way the illusion was painted for us. Let me just put it to you that way. What I discovered, and truly, George, it made me physically ill when I discovered this. I took these phone calls and the details that was being, were being made, and I realized that there was someone on board that was handling these people and telling them what to say. On the second flight out of Boston, Flight 175, United Airlines, there was a young gentleman that used the term, and he called his father at 8.52, and he said that a airline hostess had been stabbed. And now, I'm in my 60s. I started flying in the early 70s. And we have never been called airline hostess. That's a terminology that's used in Asia, maybe the Middle East, but it is not something we have been called. We've stewarded until 1968, and then we've been called flight attendants. So this whole, this guy was 32. His entire life he's heard to us called stewardess or flight attendant. And so I thought, well, that's a really weird thing to say because that's not American terminology. And so then he also he did something else that was very strange. At exactly 9 o'clock, keep this in mind, this is now three minutes prior to impact in the South Tower. On that flight, he calls his father back for the second time, and he tells his dad he thinks the hijackers are going to fly their plane to Chicago and fly them into a building. Now, before 9-11, nobody in their right mind would have ever dreamed up that scenario, and it told me that someone had told him what the drill was to be, and this is what I think was happening. The handlers on board told the crew members and the passengers, your part, did you know that there were almost a dozen war games going on that morning? Yes, that I knew. So they were told, and I've had, I can't even tell you how many American United crew members have call, contacted me, and because we would fight to the death to keep you uh, passengers safe, we have deduced that the handlers on board had to have explained to them they landed at this place remotely using this remote control as testing the system and that it was part of the war game drill or drilling air traffic control or FAA or some kind of story like that. Each aircraft had two people removed from it to make the phone calls. And they were put in a hangar in an office, and they were in different offices. That's why the people making the phone calls didn't know what the other ones were saying, like the flight attendants on Flight 11 giving completely conflicting reports about a passenger being tended to by a doctor and a nurse or being tended to by no one. Now, there was another guy that called out, and this is really interesting. This guy was a Top Gun fighter pilot trained at Miramar, California, in San Diego. Six foot two, two hundred and twenty five pounds. He fought in the Gulf War ninety one and at nine o'clock, three minutes 
prior to impact, if you've ever flown into Manhattan, you know that New York, New York is about 365 square miles. So three minutes before you're hitting the South Tower, you know you're in New York, right? And so he called his mom, and he told his mom they were hijacked. He didn't say much about the hijackers or anything else. Didn't look good. Thought he wasn't going to make it. And then he, she said, well, where are you? And he said, well, I think we're over Ohio. Well, Ohio is an hour and 45 to an hour and 55 minutes from Boston. He's a pilot. He should know that. And when you look out the window and you see Manhattan, you know you're not in Ohio or Kansas. And so I thought, well, that's an oddball thing for him to say. And then he says the one thing that was aha, my aha moment. He said eight minutes after they, the passengers figured out they'd been hijacked, eight minutes, well, he says to his mom, a bunch of us passengers think we're going to go take over the cockpit. That's the scenario for Flight 93, let's roll. And I knew right then and there that he'd been told or planned the scenario because there's no way that that would be a coincidence that they would do that same thing that they eventually claimed they did on Flight 93. Okay, now that flight, of course, went down uh, near uh, Shanksville. That's correct. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. If you're saying it did not, Mm -hmm. but something did, what was that? Boy, it's hard to say. You know, they um, there was the ditch that they showed, that divot in the ground, has been found on Google Earth Maps from 96. So um, the local people, even the coroner, the local coroner, said there was no bodies. And in any plane crash, and, you know, the listeners, I invite you to just do a Google image search on any kind of plane crash, 757 plane crash or just commercial plane crash and the Google images, and you're going to see huge sections of fuselage, especially an aircraft that large as a 757, and because that's like an old 707, just missing a couple yeah. of the engines, similar in size. It's a big aircraft. The tail is huge. And so there are parts of an aircraft crash that just don't disappear. That was the one thing I, I looked at that day, and I said, that was not a plane crash. I've seen the pictures. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. We could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. That's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. There's been at least one report that the uh, investigators out there, and there are hundreds of them, as I said tonight, um, have found nothing larger than a phone book. Well, we've got the controversy about the plane that uh, reportedly hit the Pentagon as well. Exactly. They can't find bodies or much of the plane. Now, there was a, there was something that looked like it could have been an engine, but... Uh, that, that, too, remains controversial. So let's exactly. make an assumption, Rebecca, that these four planes were taken and landed somewhere uh-huh. uh, within a region where Boston is, I guess. Uh, again, you're, you're saying they did what with the planes afterwards? I mean, where are they now? And then those oh. passengers, or are, are you saying all the passengers aboard those planes were killed after the planes landed? Yes. More, more than likely, here's another thing that people always ask, we're so light. There were 30 people on one 757. That's nothing. That holds 180 passengers. And it was a you know, coast-to-coast flight. So a lot of people have said to me, how come there weren't very many people on board? Well, I think that this was such a methodically planned out illusion that I think that some reservations phone lines were um, hijacked. And so that they were limited to how many people. If they had been full aircraft, there would have been over 800 people to handle. But since the loads were light, then it was easy for them to put them all in the back of a section, like in one area where they could make them do whatever they wanted and keep an eye on everybody, make sure phone calls weren't. Because on Flight 11, nearly 100 people, I think it was 90-some people or something, with the, and the entire crew members, it was 11 crew members and... 86 passengers or something like that, and yet only two flight attendants, those two flight attendants made a phone call, and they were on the phone for 27 minutes. So you've got to ask yourself, why didn't anybody else make a phone call? Well, this is what we think, and I've gotten my head together with a bunch of airline people that actually knew the crew members, the uh, cockpit crew and the flight attendants mm-hmm. on uh, those airlines, 
and knew them personally, and they are there dead, too, as, as well. They really did exist. The flights did operate. There were people on board, and, yes, in fact, they were killed. They were just killed in a different manner than what they showed us on television. And so what we think is that each plane, and until you get to Flight 93, each aircraft had two people removed from it, put in offices upstairs in that hangar, and then they made their phone calls. Each one had two two people making those phone calls. And these Why people didn't... did not know what was going to happen to them after. No, they, ha- they couldn't have, or the, the crew members would have fought back. I know that. And so I think that they were told by handlers that this is a drill, and they were removed those people off, those two people to make the phone calls. On Flight 93, they actually took 11 people off. There were 33 passengers or so. And I think there was seven crew members total with the pilots and the flight attendants. And once those people were removed, we are under the belief that more than likely, you know, how a predictive program and the Illuminati like to tell you what they're doing. Well, one of the things that everybody said that called out almost every phone call said they sprayed pepper spray or mace in the cabin. So we believe that some type of gas, perhaps a hydrogen cyanide or some quick-acting gas, was in there, and they shut the door. And those airplanes are sealed tight. And the, that type of gas, some type of gas like that, would, before people could really react and open the door or anything, uh, they would be affected by that. Why would they go through, and then we're going to get into who they, who they may be, mm-hmm. but why would they go through this exercise of landing the planes, taking the passengers off, killing them, and, not, and then send other planes into the exact spots that these other planes might have gone. Why not just let these original planes crash into the Twin Towers, into the Pentagon, and the one that crashed in the field in Pennsylvania? Why not just let it happen like that? Well, now, I think that that's a kind of a common question I actually get asked. And I think that... Um, they seem to duplicate themselves. Yeah, well, this was a sure thing. They, this they they actually could handle this as a sure thing, and what hit the North Tower was more than likely some type of drone aircraft. We really don't know what hit that, and it okay. could have been some military hmm. thing. Like well, that. and we have our questions of you know why those buildings went down the way they did. Many people that I've interviewed believe it's controlled demolition. Uh, Looked like it, didn't it? Well, it sure did. You've seen enough (laughs) buildings go down. So to answer your question, why would they go through this? One, they needed the precision, and they couldn't take the chance that the pilots might override that flight termination system and take control of the aircraft. At what what point, though, is this uh, speculative or something based on some fact? I mean, we really don't know that they were all pulled off the plane and killed, do we? Well... I don't think they were killed off the plane. I think they were gassed in the cabin. All of them? All of them, except for the handlers that got off. The handlers and and the pilots. Because all of the crew members, I mean, I have, you know, I have United and American Airlines pilots buying the book from the publisher in bulk because they get them for about $11 a piece and handing them out. They are so convinced this is exactly what happened. And as I continue going through this, as we continue talking some more, I'm going to tell you some of the things. Remember I mentioned to you the Brady Bonds and the gold and all those things that I discovered? Mm-hmm. Well, those, the evidence for WorldCom, uh, Global Crossing, and the Enron investigations were all being held in Building 7. That one fell down at 5.20 in the afternoon. Well, I do, I mean, do have my right. questions on why that went down when it was really never hit by anything. Exactly. And you saw that as a controlled demolition. I saw that, too, and I thought, wow, how did they get that thing wired to demolition? I didn't think it just fell on its own. And and uh, then, of course, I didn't pay much attention to it. But after I looked into it, it definitely was. Well, I will give you that there are huge inconsistencies <laughs> with the 9-11 Commission's report and what we think happened. Huge discrepancies. Mm-hmm. And things happened, the Patriot Act, and very bizarre things have gone on since, Mm. and they haven't stopped. You're answering your own question. Why would they do this? Well, look at the wars we've had in the last 14 years. Look at what we're doing. See, what what I believe happened was that some people in government knew this was coming down and didn't do anything about it, that they had that ability to stop this, to stop them all. Mm -hmm. But they said, no, let's let it happen. 
for the things we're seeing unfold today and that they let it happen. They let these 19 crazed terrorists get on board. They, they, you know, how they took over the planes, I don't know. Uh, it well, just, they're still alive, so you have to deal with that. You know, it's just, it, I mean, <laughs> I'll give you the whole thing's bizarre, but, but for me, what, what makes it stranger is the fact that, you know, you say the planes were taken and then the people were gassed. Well, down. you know, when I first discovered this, George, it truly, it physically made me sick. I missed it myself by not 10 hours. It could have been me on one of those planes. And to learn what I learned, and I'm not even done telling you everything I learned. I mean, this I took all the information that I uncovered over you know, probably three years of investigating, 20 hours a day. I lived in this until I dissected it, methodically dissected their illusion. That's the title of my book, Methodical Illusion, and that's what I did. I methodically went through every word that was said on the phone calls, why the protocols for hijacking weren't followed by anyone, what I would have done as a flight attendant. And the amazing thing to me is I think my biggest fear once I discovered this was the flight attendants and the pilots, the airline people were going to hate what I found. Because, But I, then I thought, well, it's not any worse than watching those people jump out of the towers or thinking that you're strapped in a seat and go into a building. This is It probably was a much more gentle death. I just, it's, a death is a death. And so, no, just the opposite has happened to me. I have had the most incredible response from airlines, even especially United and American people, that have said, you have figured this out, this is exactly what happened, how they did it. And you see, because I haven't told you this part yet, there were two companies involved in the FAA headquarters that were Man, able to manipulate, they were actually there for the war games, making things appear that were not real on radar for those fighter jets that were playing the war games and for the NORAD screen uh, mm-hmm. radar screen readers. But what, what's the significance of that? Well, they were able to make things appear and disappear. So once that flight termination system took over the transponder and the transponder turned off the air traffic controllers couldn't see them they had the ability to create fake flight plans and have those planes go anywhere they wanted to what's the bottom line what did they want to accomplish after they did this I think it was, a, you know, what's considered a false flag. I mean, you have the Project for New American Century, PNAC, it's referred to, and it's, you can Google search this on Wikipedia. explains it really well. There were a group of people that actually planned, and they said in this plan, the necessity to get the American people behind these seven wars coming in the Middle East. A new Pearl Harbor were the words they used in the Project for the New American Century. And you can look back now. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, isn't it, George? Sometimes it is. Sometimes yeah. it is. Yeah, and so when we look back, and I think what's happening, and instead of the people, I thought people would be angry at this, this what I discovered, and what I discovered, I mean, I have not had anybody try to even attempt to refute this, especially airline people. They're just on board. I, I, it's just, you figured this out. This is exactly what happened. And these are their coworkers, and especially because most of these people are coming from American and United. It was very difficult for me. I truly was physically ill. I couldn't write. I couldn't even think or eat for a while once I discovered what I did because it, it was very tough, I, and I was, I was so close to being there. So what I found are these companies that were able to manipulate the radar. They showed us what they wanted on radar. You know, I just got a Facebook from someone that said to me they, they knew Betty Ong and flown with her, and she would never have stayed on the airplane 20 minutes, and that she was an excellent flight, flight attendant and followed all the rules. So, you know, that's the kind of support I get, and those are the people to me that are important. And, you know, that's who I, I dedicated myself to find the planes, the passengers, and the crew, because that was my world. That was my life. And I realized this, George, that those phone calls, they had to have been made. They had to have been made so we knew who to shoot, who to aim our guns at, who to unfurl our flags and attack, and who to support, the, what wars. Were. They, and the terminology that they used was the most obnoxious and craziest. I've, I've flown for 30 years. I flew out of Amsterdam with, you know, probably 80 different ethnic groups in 65 different languages yeah. or more. 
And I would never say about someone, you or anyone else, he's of Middle Eastern descent. And those words right there were used by almost every phone caller in that same terminology. Like it was scripted? Very much so. Mm -hmm. And these are the things I found. I just, that's how I, I realized that this was scripted and, and it wasn't protocol and it was crazy stuff to say. And I realized then that if we didn't know that the hijackers were Middle Eastern descent, we wouldn't be able to go to those wars Mm -hmm. now, would we? Mm -hmm. I don't think cell phones work on planes up there 30,000 feet. They absolutely did not. I'm pretty sure they don't. They still don't. I just recently flew, and about 1,800 feet, I lost cell reception. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine's a private pilot, and he said he turned his phone on at about 5,000 feet, and his phone said, forbidden. Well, wasn't there also a reported call from um, a Barbara Olson to her husband? Yes, on Flight 77, there were, again, two people that called, and it was one flight attendant, Renee May, who called her mom and dad, and Barbara Olson, who was married to the Solicitor General, Department of Justice, Ted Olson. And she was a CNN commentator. And she's the only person that reported their weapon was a box cutter. And so it's interesting, that story, that's kind of a side story that, I mean, it's really kind of fascinating because Ted Olson first said she tried to call, she called in collect from a cell phone. Well, that's impossible. And then he said, no, she called from an air phone. Well, I've had people from American Airlines tell me that, of course, they knew better because their 757s had had all of their onboard air phones decommissioned by January 31st, 2001. So we know she didn't call from an air phone. She had to have called from her cell phone on the ground. In 2001, I remember standing in a 757 back galley with a bunch of flight attendants. We all had different carriers, AT&T, Mobile, T-Mobile. Do you have any bars? Do you have any reception? The aircraft itself is somewhat of a Kip Faraday cage because of the wiring and the metal, the aluminum. I'll give you the fact that everything involved in that tragedy that day Mm -hmm. was very strange. Mm -hmm. Everything, including the reaction of President Bush when he was with the little kids in Florida. Buildings like that just don't collapse and fall. Mm -hmm. If if there was controlled demolition, and I've talked to a lot of experts about it, Richard Gage, Mm -hmm. Dr. Judy Wood, if it was controlled demolition, they would have had to have put things in that building weeks before this happened. Don't you agree? Yeah, I'm sure of that. My main thing was the airplanes but and how they did that. But I still got into that part of it, too. And um, I'm pretty sure they used multiple methods for the towers especially. It would have taken some time, but I know that bomb-sniffing dogs were, rem- were removed a-, a week or two before. I- there was a power down the weekend before. And so there was a lot of really suspicious things going on and a lot of interesting people connected to the security at that building. So what you're concluding, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I will, there's a (laughs) rogue element of government and that they are totally out of control. That would be correct. There was a journalist, an investigative journalist, by the name of Danny Casolaro. Danny Casolaro was on the trail of the octopus. And he was following, and he, I found all these people too, the Iran-Contra, drugs for arms, the Pan Am 103, heroin, and even back to the Kennedy assassination. And everyone that I have found connected to 9-11 somehow connects back to one or all of those events as well. The octopus, I refer to it in the book, is like the shadow government. The company that I was telling you was in the FAA headquarters for two years, manipulating radar, MITRE, it's called M-I-T-R-E, and it is basically the shadow government. I'm old enough to remember when Kennedy was assassinated, and I remember hearing this military-industrial complex took him out, assassinated him, and I never did figure out who that was until I did this research, and it's very much so the same people involved. And the fact that it's okay for us as a nation and our FBI and our government officials, it's okay for us to claim that 19 Arabs did this when they in fact didn't, and then we can go bomb all the other countries that weren't even involved in it over this. And we're doing this all on the illusion that 9-11 was. And it's very sad to see that what has come out of this. 
and we have we have literally killed millions of people on an illusion and it's to keep the military industrial complex alive there are rogue elements inside and outside of our government that can do things without any government responsibility i even found two women involved not man arab hij- hijackers i found two women perpetrators or handlers in this in an fbi document well, there's no doubt about that. that. We've seen what they tried to do with false weapons of mass destruction with uh, Iraq. And as soon as we left, everything fell apart because, once again, we screwed up everything we touched. We seem to meddle with a, with a drastic foreign policy. Somehow between World War II, where we were brilliant, and what happened afterwards with Vietnam and everything else, everything fell apart. You know, people... We really don't want to think that there are factions within countries that could do things like this. Well, my world fell apart when I discovered it, so I, yes, I agree with you. And it all goes back to the Kennedy assassination. You know, after 1963, they figured that they can get away with anything they wanted. We need something to get the Americans just all upset. So they create that, that we were attacked. And and, uh, in we go, and we saw that disaster. So, you know, on and on and on, the uh, situation again with uh, Saddam Hussein, who was not a Boy Scout, but we set him up. And look what's happened now. So of everything you've uncovered, what do you find to be the most disturbing aspect of all of this? Well, you know, once you get over... To realize where we are today, it's, it's pretty heartbreaking. I mean, I we fought for freedom, not for this craziness. But here's something that happened to me after one of the first interviews I did. Now, where I knew that this place had to have at least a 10,000-foot runway to bring these aircraft, and all the phone calls and the flight times all work to this one location. And during a interview, I don't usually tell that where that is, because I want people to read the book for sure. all the other reasons. And I want to tell people, just to protect you, we're doing this interview with you. You're not home. You're at another location. I am, actually, yeah. yeah. It's important for people to understand <laughs> that. What happens is I found this reserve base, and it was a C-5 transport base, just well within 20 minutes from Boston. It had 11,595-foot runway, plenty long enough to land that 67 heavy with fuel. After an interview I did, I had someone contact me that was in a reserve unit based there. And this woman was absolutely freaked out. She told me exactly where the base was, the Mm -hmm. name of it. She was based there, and the reserves went active that morning. On 9-11, they activated her unit. She said when they got to the base... Before or after things happened? After things started happening that morning. Well, that's not unusual. But here's what's unusual. When they got to the base, it had been evacuated of all personnel, and they were locked out and sent to hotels for two to three days. And she didn't know because those four aircraft were there. And these have... this particular place has large hangars large enough for a c5 transport you know how big they are bigger than a 747 yeah they're huge so easily they could have pulled these things in there also every i even hate to say this but it's necessary the future plan is not a pretty picture we need to wake people up and we need to get them prepared now where are the planes today that is a great question, and you know, it's an interest. I found another interesting character involved in all of this. Uh, this whole thing. You'll remember the missing or misplaced two point three trillion dollars from the Pentagon that was announced by Donald Rumsfeld the day before. There's always money missing. He had announced that on television the day before nine eleven. Well, the comptroller of the U.S. Pentagon was Rabbi Dov Zakheim. Zakheim also owned the company that made the flight termination system. That's the system that we use to run our, our drones around the world still to this day. He also had a subsidiary company. That company is called SPC that makes the flight termination system that was sold to Boeing to remotely take over the aircraft. He also had a subsidiary company called TriData. TriData came in and did a lot of the construction after the 93 bombing of the World Trade Towers. So they had actually the blueprints to the tower. He also was involved with a consortium, a group 
of people that did something else, and this will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. They refurbished commercial 767s and turned them into military refueling tankers and sold them hmm. to militaries around the world. Well, and those planes were going so fast, if you blink, you're going to miss it. One minute before impact, the flight attendant that was on the phone, Amy Sweeney, was asked by her supervisor, can you tell where you are? She'd been flying 13 years, and anybody that's ever flown in and out of LaGuardia, Newark, or JFK knows where you are. When you look out the window and you're over New York, you know where you're at, you're over New York. And she said, I see buildings, I see water, oh no, crash, boom. And any flight attendant that's been flying more than a month has been in the New York once can look out the window and say we're over, over New York. And so I found that really odd as well. Plus, again, there is no sound of jets in those phone calls. And that was another thing that almost everybody on the receiving end of all those phone calls said it was dead quiet. All right. I want to read something that Mark Bernback, who was a Fox reporter in New York at the time, said he said, it definitely didn't look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the side. Again, it was not a normal flight that I've ever seen at any airport. It had a blue logo on the front, and it did not look like it belonged in the area. Including some uh, police and fireboats that it flew right over. They claimed it was a military jet. Good observation. Good observation, good. Dennis. What is your biggest conclusion about all of this? I guess, simply put, it was a very, very well-thought-out, methodical illusion, a false flag, an inside job. Later on, found out in my research that on August 6th, Condoleezza Rice and George Bush were passing around some sort of document, and they knew that this was going to happen. If they would have wanted to stop it, George, do you know all the FAA had to do was send out one directive to the pilots and flight attendants of this country, no and we would never have let them on board. But now we're finding out that they might not have even been on board, because 10 of them are still alive. Some members of the 9-11 Commission don't think it did a thorough job. Something hit those buildings and those buildings came down for some reason. Rebecca, you want to react to any of that? Well, I, you know, I did a little research into those buildings. The buildings were supposedly hit by 767s. They're similar in length, a little bit wider in the fuselage. Than, but the, I uh, believe that they were actually designed to take more than one. But let me just say this, over 30 years, I have seen large hail from in the Midwest. You know, you can get hail up to the size of a softball. What I saw was large hail pieces come down and absolutely destroy a, a, an aluminum aircraft. They're very fragile, and bird strikes as well. And remember what we just saw in LaGuardia when Delta Airlines went and slid off the runway. They went into a wrought iron fence and ripped one of the wings completely off. The other one was cut in half, and the fuselage was ripped all along the bottom. That's just going about maybe 40 or 50 miles an hour at the most into a wrought iron fence. That's what happens to an aluminum airplane, and that's why airline pilots and professionals keep asking me, how did they make that happen? The maximum speed on a 767 is a little over 500 miles an hour at 35,000 feet. At 700 feet or 1,000 feet where they were when they hit the buildings, there is no way that they could structurally travel that fast that they, the government is claiming they're going. So they, they couldn't have gone as fast as a missile. So do we win in the long run, Rebecca? Do we beat these people? You know, I think the best thing we can do for this type of darkness and evil is to shed this light on it that we're doing right now. And Dov Zakheim, the comptroller of the U.S. Pentagon, he also had a subsidiary company of his corporation, SPC, called Tridata. Tridata actually had all the blueprints, so if anybody wanted to set detonation, whoever owns the blueprints would have the easiest time. No uh, Middle Eastern descent or Arabs or Arabs living in a cave in Afghanistan would have had the blueprints, but his company did, which to me makes a whole lot more sense than trying to blame it on someone in a foreign country. 
and putting all of that together, it would be a lot easier. And by the way, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth cannot to this day get the blueprints for those buildings, and they've been gone for 14 years. What about the gold, the gold that apparently was in those buildings? Where did it go? That's a great question. And, you know, I cover that a little bit in the book about the stolen gold because there were not just gold, there were gold bonds called Brady Bonds, $240 billion worth. Some of it was physical gold that needed to be kind of laundered back into a very heavily monitored gold market. And so that's one of the reasons they claim that the SEC was shut down for two weeks. It took that long to funnel away this gold, and that was something that George H.W. Bush Sr. was a part of. We've never been the same since, Rebecca. Well, that's true, and uh, we just need to stop this next thing, and we need to be aware that the powers that be, that this military-industrial complex octopus monster, they have plans for us that aren't good, so we need to shed the light on it and wake up people. And that's why I wrote the book, to help people understand that I know it's, a, it's much easier to stay in your fantasy world and think that you're safe and the government's keeping you safe. It's very hard to swallow. Trust me, I got sick when I found it. Rebecca, thanks. The name of the book, of course, Methodical Illusion. Sorry, Mr. President. Howard Dean recently seemed to muse aloud whether you had advanced knowledge of 9-11. Do you agree or disagree with the RNC that this kind of rhetoric borders on political hate speech? Yeah. Uh, look, there's time for politics. And, uh, you know, it's time for politics. And uh, I, uh, 